Hello and uh, welcome. My name is Brenda Davison. This is uh, SFU Math 152, Section 5.2, The Definite Integral. Okay, so here we are, a quote from uh, Terence Tao, uh, an absolutely incredible mathematician currently uh, currently uh, working. Uh, he uh, has a nice line here at the end of his quote. I want to just under underline this. So when we're trying to solve problems, we are going to try to use ingenuity rather than brute force. Uh, brute force uh, sometimes necessary and sometimes it works, but oftentimes it's super labor intensive and uh, takes up a long time. So we're going to try to, as we go through this stuff, uh, learn as best we can to do things in, in a clever manner and save ourselves time. Uh, Terence Tao has a book, uh, How to uh, Solve It, a, a book about mathematical uh, problem solving. Uh, definitely would recommend uh, taking a look at that uh, if you have a chance. Okay, so what is the definite integral? This is an important uh, moment in Calculus 2. We are talking about, uh, we're, for most of the course, we are going to be talking about integration and, and what we can do with the integrals. And so we definitely have to understand what it means when we use the symbol and how we define the definite integral. So here it is. We have a continuous function on a closed interval. Uh, we divide it up into uh, n subintervals. Uh, so this is exactly what we were doing when we were calculating area in the last lecture. And uh, they're of equal width. That's the, um, the right endpoint minus the left endpoint. That's B minus A over N. Now that's, the, that's the width of our rectangles. And then uh, we have <clears throat> the endpoints of all the subintervals uh, labeled in this manner here. And then what we do is we choose any sample point. So we, we, in our examples from last time, we, we saw what would happen if we choose the left side of the rectangle uh, to evaluate our function at, or maybe we would charge, choose the right side of our rectangle. Now what we're saying is like, you know what? It doesn't really matter. Take any sample point in each rectangle. So the xi star, this guy here, is in the i subinterval. Okay, so we, we could be in the middle of the rectangle, we could be uh, you know, really close to the left edge, but not quite there, we could be three quarters of the way to the right edge, it doesn't matter. Okay, and then we are going to define the definite integral from A, uh, sorry, the definite integral of F, that's the function, from A to B, that is the left endpoint A, and then that is the right endpoint B, and we write it in this manner, right here. Okay, and we'll, I will say that the integral from a to b of f of x dx, and it's defined to be the limit of the sum, just like we saw last time. We, we saw this limit last time in calculating area, and we're going to now define that to be the definite integral. The only difference from what we saw in the last lecture is we have our function here evaluated at x i star, that any point in the interval. Okay, so these definite integrals, uh, we, well, we've already seen because we've now equated it to the sum, it shows up in computing area, but it, it shows up in a lot of other places. So we'll just make a few of the uh, applications of this. We have, we've seen this one, area, but also um, we touched upon how we could use it to compute distance. Uh, what else? Um, arc length, so the length of a curve. We'll see that. Uh, what else? Uh, we'll see uh, volumes, uh, other other physical properties, uh, work, um, center of mass. Okay, so it's it's a tremendously useful tool. We 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 can, we're going to be able to use <clears throat> the definite integral to calculate uh, many things. Okay, so here's a visual representation of what I was saying. There is the function in blue going from a to b, and then this. Uh, gray shaded area here that is the i subinterval and then that xi right here that is any point within here <clears throat> that's the only new thing from last week there's a few things to note uh, about the uh, definite integral the definite integral is defined as a limit uh, so there's a couple things that are that must happen the limit must exist otherwise you don't have a definite integral so that, that's important. The limit must exist. And also, the limit must give the same value, um, the same value uh, for all possible choices of the sample points. Okay. 
Okay, we saw in the first lecture that the left-hand sum and the right-hand sum, uh, when we took the limit, uh, it gave us the same number for the area. And, and the, now as we're saying is no matter what choice we make for xi, where in the interval we decide to sample, that uh, when, when we take the limit, we'll always get the same number. Those two, those two things must occur. Okay, let's get some uh, uh, terminology down. It, it is important uh, when you are doing uh, mathematics and when you're learning, especially when you're learning a new topic, that you are absolutely clear about what the words mean. You, you, it's very difficult to understand if you're a little bit vague on what the symbols or the words mean. So we're going to, as we go through this course, I'm going to put lots of emphasis on making sure that we understand the uh, the meaning of the words and the symbols so that uh, uh, that when we communicate, uh, it's clear what I'm saying to you. And when you communicate back to me via our Zoom sessions and such, that you I, I can understand clearly what you're saying. Okay, so this elongated S thing here is, is, is the integral sign. Uh, the function that we are integrating right there, f of x, that is called the integrand. Um, a and b are the limits of integration, with a being the lower limit and b being the upper limit. And uh, when, we, when we make a computation of this guy, we call that procedure integration. This guy on the right-hand side is called a Riemann sum. Okay, so that is the taking the limit of the sums of the rectangles as the number of rectangles goes to infinity. That is called the Riemann sum. Okay, this is the Riemann sum, and then <clears throat> we take the limit as n goes to infinity. Okay, let's get some facts out. Uh, some some of these are unsurprising, but uh, we will actually use these sometimes in clever ways to uh, make problems simpler. So we're going to we're going to have them sort of in our pocket even though some of them are fairly fairly obvious. Okay, that first fact that I think is, is very straightforward. If the function is bigger than 0 on the whole interval, then the integral is bigger than 0. If the function is less than 0 on the whole interval, then the integral is less than 0. Okay, so that's basically telling us in the less than 0 case if you had some function that looked like that, you can imagine the situation. You're putting in rectangles like this, and the width of the rectangle is here, and then the function evaluated at this place, at these places here, will be negative. I mean, the, these these numbers here are negative. So you 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 don't get in the what we would call an air. Like if we were to ask what the area here was, we would say it was positive, of course, because area is always positive. But if we're just talking about evaluating the integral, we are talking about multiplying this distance times this. Uh, function value and that is negative. So when the function is below zero on the whole interval, then the integral is negative. So in general, if you when you when you do this procedure, we get what's called what we call the signed area, which means the area above the axis, above the x-axis, minus the area below. I should say below the x-axis. Okay, so it's important uh, uh, to notice this this sort of issue. Here's the sine function, for example, from um, zero to uh, two pi. So uh, this is uh, y equals uh, sine x. Okay, if I were to ask what is the integral from zero to two pi, so if I ask this question, the integral from zero to two pi of sine x dx, then I could tell you immediately that would be zero because this 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 area here is the same as this area here and then this the integral computation of this part is going to come out to the exact negative value as the integral computation of this part and they will cancel one another so the signed area here would be zero clearly though if you were going to buy carpet or something like that to sort of carpet this area and you were making a calculation of that you wouldn't uh, say oh i don't need any carpet so you got, we have to be careful like when we're going to when we have to distinguish between the definite integral and area, because when the function is going above and below the x-axis, those things can make a difference. Okay, so that's a, a word of caution there. Okay, here we have uh, part C here. We have a precise meaning of what that uh, limit means. Uh, I think that is something uh, that's a technical thing. We won't actually really be uh, using that, but for those of you who, who saw the precise definition of the limit in 
calculus one this was this is looks similar to what you see in section 2.4 of the Stewart textbook that's where where you where you learn about how how, how a limit is precisely defined okay um, <clears throat> we can also um, release one more constraint we've had on setting up our our sums and that is here we have previously the only change in this this next little statement here is this right here we, we had this previously as delta x because all of the widths of all of the rectangles were the same that was our previous model now i'm saying what well, it actually doesn't even matter if the rectangles are the same width when you do this calculation so i could for example take i could take let's see how many am i going to get here one two three four rectangles and i could make them look like that so the spacing isn't even um, that that would be a four rectangle um, uh, situation and then this would be delta x uh, zero delta x one delta x two and delta x three they don't have to be the same so long as when you do this limiting process the biggest one uh, goes to zero because if the biggest one goes to zero they all go to zero and everything is good so you can sample at any point within your rectangle and your rectangles do not need to be of the same size. Okay, a uh, couple of other notes that I want to uh, make here. Important, important things. Note, note uh, the integral from a to b of f of x dx is a number. It is a number. Okay number and we're going to see the indefinite integral coming soon and in that case we're going to see that the indefinite integral will result in a function so we don't want to we want to get right into our head now when we make a, a computation like this with a definite integral we're going to get a number that means in fact if i go like this d by doesn't even matter what variable i do it with but let's just go d by dx if i take this like that We've, you've learned how to take derivatives in calculus one. If I ask you, what is the derivative of the definite integral like that? That is zero because the derivative of a constant is zero. Okay, this is, a, this is a, a way that you can trip yourself up. Next thing, uh, the variable name doesn't matter. Okay, this one um, I am going to often use, as does the textbook, identify functions by calling the function f, the name f, and then by using x as the independent variable. So that, that's just a very typical thing, and I'm using a and b as the um, lower and upper limit. So that's very typical uh, a thing to see. However, there is no difference between what I wrote there and this. Okay, no difference at all. And so do not get confused if it, there is just a relabeling of the independent variable. It's, it's somehow we get so used to using X that sometimes we uh, can confuse ourselves when we don't use X. In fact, we would never do this in practice, but there would be absolutely nothing in, in fact wrong with doing that. Okay, it's the, it is just a symbol that denotes the independent variable. So this is uh, just to really emphasize this point because I, 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 I do see this sometimes come up where, where students can compute this, but they find this more difficult to compute when it's actually exactly the same uh, computation. So uh, let me just draw an analogy here and that would be, um, so what if I said evaluate Evaluate uh, t squared minus 3t for t equals 2. And then later I say evaluate x squared minus 3x for x equals 2. These are exactly the same statements. You, know, you get exactly the same answer. That's the same, the same point I'm making here. So. All right. There's some things... Uh, that we've already talked about that that you do need to know because we are going to be using sums uh, a lot and that is uh, we, we saw this one in the first lecture if i simply add up the first n integers then i can compute that from 
the nth integer as n times n plus 1 over 2. Okay, there's an easy way to see this, and that is this thing here. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. Let, let us do the n equals 5 case. Okay, so this is the sum from i equals 1 to 5 of i. I, I write it like that. I, I add it up in, uh, in the brute force method, and I find out that that is, let's see, 9, 10, 15. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to just reverse them. And I, I get, add that up and I, I get 15. Of course, it's going to be 15. I haven't done anything. I've just reversed the order uh, um, that I added the numbers in. Then I look at adding the numbers this way. I'm going to add uh, 1 plus 5 and get 6, 2 plus 4 and get 6, 3 plus 3 and get 6, like that. Then I add these two and I get 30. Now I can actually use a cleverer method for adding all these sixes together. I see how many are there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's five sixes. And so that is 5 times 6, and of course that's 30. And then I see what I actually wanted was 15. And now I see I could be thinking of this as 5 times 6 over 2. And that, of course, allows me to uh, uh, see how this, this, this formula here applies. Okay, so uh, uh, you can regenerate that one uh, yourself sort of by going through a smaller example and then seeing how it works and you can probably fairly easily get the formula back. Um, the second formula that we saw was this one, the sum of the squares, uh, which is uh, which we can write as n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. So I would like you to look um, at Appendix E in, the, in our Stuart Calculus uh, textbook. This is proved two different ways. Uh, one uh, one way is by one of the ways is by induction, and that um, is highly useful in proving all of these types of formulas. It, you you can't find the formula by induction, but what you can do is play around in you know, looking at the pattern until you get what you think might be the formula, and then you can attempt to prove it. And if you can, then you know that you're right. Okay, so you could take a quick look at the proof by induction on these. I'm not going to ask uh, you guys to prove these uh, on, any, on any examinations. However, by looking through the proofs and seeing that these things, why these things uh, must be correct, uh, you usually gain considerable ability uh, in order to be able to remember them and uh, see why they're true. Okay. All right. So, and also, I guess the other thing to say is we'll be using these ones, these two frequently. We won't be using this one as, as much, but here's the sum of the cubes. It's actually not hard to remember because it is just the square of this one here. Okay, more importantly, uh, other ones that we will be using, uh, this one here. If we add up a constant n times, that is simply n times the constant. You notice this c here is independent of i. Okay, and similarly uh, here, this c, I'm going to just because it still is the C rate here is independent of I, which means that we can uh, uh, factor it out. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm moving it out here. I'm factoring it out. Okay. This is like going like this: uh, 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 five times one plus five times two plus five times three plus five times four is the same as five times one plus two plus three plus four. Okay. That is the factoring it out uh, um, thing right here. Okay, so that is, uh, is that thing here. If we have uh, uh, two things here added and subtracted, we can do it in two separate sums. We're going to use this one actually quite frequently um, as we, as we want to manipulate the summation notation. Okay, let's put all this newfound knowledge to uh, use and evaluate uh, this integral here. Now we are going to evaluate this from the definition of the integral. We're not going to use any integration techniques that you may have already learned and which we will learn and uh, and which of course are faster and easier to do. But first we are going to uh, do this directly uh, from from the definition. Okay, so here here's if, and if you're asked on an exam to el evaluate a definite integral from the definition of the integral this is the way that you uh, would need to do it okay so this is from the definition it's the limit of, as n goes to infinity of the sum of all of the rectangles where the height of the rectangle is the function evaluated at xi times the width of the rectangle and in this case 
uh, delta x is going to be 2 minus 0 over n. Okay, we're going to divide it up into n rectangles, and the whole uh, width, that the, the entire interval that we're evaluating the integral on is uh, 2 minus 0. So that's 2 over n. And so we'll, the, the, the end points, as referred to when we had the definition a couple of slides back, we have that x0 is 0, uh, x1, we move over, 1 delta x, and then x2, uh, we move over 2 delta x's, x3, we move over 3 delta x's, and we keep going until we get to xn, at which point we've moved over n delta x's, and we are at b. Okay, so we're going to set it up in this way. So substituting what we know into here, that's going to be the limit as n goes to infinity. We've got x0, x1, x2, x3. We need to understand what the ith one is, but we can we can we can see what that is uh, by just observing this pattern here, and then we were like, oh, I see. So xi is then i times two over n. So we're going to evaluate the function at xi. That's going, and the function is uh, this guy right here, x squared minus x. So this is going to be two i over n. That's xi squared minus 2i over n. So that is f at xi, and then it is going to be multiplied by delta x, and delta x is that, that is this one here, delta x is 2 over n. Okay, um, <clears throat> that is actually in some ways possible. Well, there's a couple of things that are, are trickier. One is making sure that you're you clearly understand how, where the rectangle, you know, how you're setting up the rectangles, what the height and width are, and and then uh, writing out the correct uh, limit of the, the the limit of the correct sum. Okay, that's step one. Once you've done that, it it, it comes into uh, algebra, and it also comes into making sure that you can handle these. Um, um, summation things correctly. Now, now our objective at this point is to be able to maneuver this thing into a format where we can actually take the limit. With this, with this summation guy there, I, I can't take the limit, right? I, I, I can't see how to take the limit. So my idea is to use those formula on the previous page and write this in in a in a form that does not have a, 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 the sum. From one to n in it, it is it is a it has just an expression as a function of n, and then once that happens, I'll be able to take the limit, and then everything is going to be good. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, I'm first going to uh, distribute the two n. So I'm I'm distributing this like this. Okay, so I'm going to write that out. That's going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum i equals one to n. 2i over n squared times 2n minus the limit as n goes to infinity. So not, not only am I distributing, but I am also using that the sum, this I've got two things here and I'm separating them as that was the last rule that we had on the previous slide. So I'm doing that in this step as well. This is going to be i equals 1 to n. This is now the second piece. 2i over n times 2 over n. Okay, now I'm going to use the formula. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look and I'm going to see what things do not depend upon i. All of this stuff here and all of this stuff here does not depend upon i. So it is a constant with respect to i. So that means I can factor those things outside of the summation. Uh, notation. So I'm going to do that. That's going to be then the limit as n goes to infinity of, let's see where I'm at. I got 2 squared times 2, 2 cubed over n squared. Then I have the sum as uh, i goes from 1 uh, to, oh, hang on, I, I detecting, I'm detecting a mistake. I, I, I see, hang on a sec, I got this wrong. I've got uh, n squared here. And I've got n here, so this should be n cubed. So then I've got the sum from <clears throat> 1 to n of i squared. 
and then I minus the limit as n goes to infinity. I do the same thing. I factor out correctly uh, 2 squared over n squared, and then I have the sum as i goes from 1 to n of i. And I have formula to deal with those two sums. So I, are, I know what this is. And I can write this as a function in terms of n. So th that's what I'm, I'm going to do next, so that I then we'll be able to take the limit. That's my next step. That's going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of uh, 2 cubed over n cubed. And then using the formula for i squared, the sum of the first n squares, I get the following n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. Then I do the same thing here. Limit as n goes to infinity of 2 squared over n squared. And I use the formula for the sum of the first n integers. And I have here uh, n times n plus 1 over 2. OK, I mean, really, now, all, in, in, unless there's a flub up, really, the problem is getting very close to being solved. Because now I have a limit of a polynomial. And the mm, polynomial has it's a polynomial in of n, and the degree of the polynomial uh, for this first one is n cubed in the numerator. Well, it's a degree order three in the numerator and order three in the, in the denominator. So the limit will be the ratio of the leading coefficients. So that's two to the four over six. Okay, that's this two, these three twos, and that six. Okay. Then the other one, I, I see I've got a quadratic in, in the numerator, a quadratic in the denominator. So I look at the leading term, the ratio of the leading terms on the square term, and that is going to be 2 squared divided by 2, which is 2. Then I, I do the arithmetic there, and I find out it's 2 thirds. Okay. So I have now evaluated that integral. I have, I have, from the definition of the integral, I have found that the integral from 0 to 2 of x squared minus x dx is equal to 2 thirds. For those of you who already know how to uh, integrate uh, uh, via uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus, let me just uh, make that calculation here. If you don't know how to do this, do not worry about it because we are, we are going to get to this. For those of you who do, this is what it looks like. It's clearly faster. Um, and of course, uh, you get the same answer. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we can sort of check ourselves. But let me just reiterate that if on an examination you are asked to find the value of a definite integral from the definition, then you must do it via the limit of the sums in this way. This would be not acceptable under that case. But of course, I mean, be smart. Quickly do this to check that you've got the right answer after you've, after you've done it via the definition. Okay, let's just try to make sure we can pattern match and go backwards. That is, we're going we're gonna to be given a limit, and uh, we're going to try to express that as a definite integral um, on, an, uh, on an interval between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, so let's just write the, the general case here. The integral from a to b of f of x dx is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum of i equals 1 to n of f of x i star delta x. Okay, and I'm just going to match uh, that with what I'm seeing above. Uh, maybe just before I do that, I'm going to look at this and I say, okay, I see what the interval is I'm interested in. That means that uh, the lower limit of integration is going to be pi and the upper limit of integration is going to be 2 pi. So I've already identified um, the a and the b from that. Now I'm looking at these, this limit that I've been given and I'm going to match that with what I've, what I've written down here. So I've got that's there. I mean, that is there. This is here, which uh, shows me that uh, f at x i star is, must be 1 plus x i uh, cos x i. And that, of course, means that f of x, again, this is just a, a variable, 1 plus x cos x. 
and now my problem is uh, solved. This 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 guy right here, this limit, is exactly the same as this integral, pi to two pi of one plus x cos x dx. Okay. If we're looking at this limit here, this delta x would be would be actually uh, 2 pi minus pi over n, which is pi over n. All right, so sort of see how we can go back and forth. Next example, I would try to show that this integral, the integral from 0 to 2 of the square root of 4 minus x squared uh, dx is pi, uh, this immediately appears difficult. I mean, we could set it up as a limit. Why don't you stop the video and just try that? Set it up as a limit and then see what limit you get. Then turn the video back on and see that if you get this limit. So I could set it up as a limit. Here it is. The limit as n goes to infinity, the sum pi equals 1 to n of the square root of 4 minus 2i over n squared times 2 over n. I mean, I immediately see that I'm not going to be able to use any of the summation formulas that I have because of that nasty little square root. I, I, I don't see how to simplify that. I mean, in this case, we've been told uh, where we're going. So, I mean, in fact, I could <laughs> I could write this like that. I, I know that's the answer. But um, have we seen any limits in, in calculus 1? So now in the problem solving model, you think to yourself, okay, have I seen any limits that actually uh, resulted in pi? So that's a question you could ask yourself. Or um, we could say, so that's one, one model. We, we, we know how to take some limits anyways. Um, the other thing is we already know that these things here, which is in fact what we're trying to evaluate, we know that uh, it's an area. We can think of it as an area. So then I think to myself, okay, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll draw a graph of this function and see what area it is that's being computed. And so I will do that in this manner. So I know that the function uh, is uh, y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared. In order to see what this looks like, I'm going to square both sides and I get uh, y squared equals uh, 4 minus x squared, and then I get x squared plus y squared equals to 4. Okay, the, clearly that is the equation of a circle. It is centered at 0 with radius 2. Make sure that you recognize this as the upper um, uh, semicircle, this, this part right here. Oh, that is a circle. It had, it, if it had a minus in front of it, it would be the lower half. Okay, so that is uh, minus 2 to 2. That's what it looks like. Okay, and we are being asked to take the integral from 0 to 2. So basically this integral this integral right here is a representation of this area. Okay, now in fact our problem is solved because we're like, hey, we know how to calculate the area of circles and the area we want is actually the, the, the integral, this, this integral here is a representation of the, of the area of um, one quarter of the area, if I call this integral A, it is one quarter of the area of a circ of a circle of radius two. Okay, so that's great. Then I can just calculate it as one quarter times pi r squared. That's pi. That so sometimes by applying your knowledge of of the fact that these definite integrals are, can be representing an area, and knowing that we have a formula for finding some of those areas, we can bypass the whole limit thing and come out there with the with the value for the in for the value of the definite integral through thinking of it as an area. Okay. Choosing a good sample point. Okay, so. Oftentimes, if you're going to approximate an integral, like you're not going to take the limit as n goes to infinity, you're just going to use some number of rectangles to get close enough, it's usually better to use the midpoint okay, uh, as your sampling point. 
Okay, that's fine. Uh, so that's just something to bear in mind when you're making the calculation. Sometimes the midpoint uh, is a good idea. So here is uh, here is how you find the midpoint. You you take the two endpoints and you add them together and you take half. So you can find the midpoint. Okay, so let us just do that here. We're going to use the midpoint rule with n equals 4 to approximate. So this is clearly not going to be exactly right. What we're going to do is be approximating this integral with 4 uh, rectangles. Let me just quickly draw a picture of what that looks like. We've got 1 over x squared. That looks like that. And we are attempting to find the uh, value between 1 and 5. Okay, and we're going to use four rectangles of even size. Let me just try to get those rectangles in here like that. Now we've got, so this is going to be one, two, three, four rectangles. And then because we're using the midpoint rule, what we're doing is we're taking the heights of our rectangles in the middle like that. This is what the midpoint rule means. So that the, our rectangle is going to look like this. That one, the height is being set up in the middle like that. You can see why this midpoint rule often results in a better approximation because you are a little bit too high on half the rectangle and a little bit too low on the other half and those those problems kind of cancel one another out okay so that is the midpoint rule with uh, n equals four this is the number of rectangles and it's going to give me an approximate value there's still going to be some error here but uh, but less than if I, if I use the left or uh, right um, uh, rectangles to approximate the, the 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 r the r4 or the l4. Okay, so I now need to figure out. Uh, well, I mean, when I just draw that on my drawing here, I need to figure out. I've got two, three, four. So I need to figure out what are these numbers here. That's not too hard to do. So this number here is 1.5. This number here 2.5. This number here 3.5, and this number here. 4.5. Okay, so those are my uh, x values at which I'm going to evaluate my function. So now I can write out what is my approximate value for this integral. This is from 1 to 5 of 1 over x squared, the function, and that is approximately the sum from i equals 1 to 4 of the function evaluated at the ith, uh, on the ith interval at the midpoint times by the width of the rectangle. And that sum is equal to the sum here. Okay, let me just write that here. This sum f at xi delta x, that sum is going to be the first rectangle. That's going to be the function evaluated at 1.5. That is the height of the first rectangle. And then delta x, which is 1. That is the width of the rectangle. And then the function second rectangle, the height of the second rectangle, the width, and the third one, the width, and Sorry about that. Let me put that one down here. The, the 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 fourth rectangle, the height of the fourth rectangle times the width of the fourth rectangle. So I mean, all those ones are are gone, and then I have this one over 1.5 squared plus one over 2.5 squared uh, plus one over 3.5 squared plus one over 4.5 squared, and that. It's a bit of a tedious calculation, but maybe not as tedious as you'd think. But anyway, you could, I mean, this would be obviously done, maybe not this part, but after this using a calculator. Okay. Okay, so I add all those things together and I get this thing here. And I because I just, because I find numbers so absolutely unbelievably cool, I do have to quickly show you this. Uh, this is these are squares where the where there are two digits effectively and ending in pi and let me just show you like for example 15 squared is 225 uh, 25 squared is um, 625 35 squared is 1225 how am I doing this I'm actually not copying it off a piece of paper although you can't see that so you may or may not believe that but uh, 55 squared is uh, 30 uh, 25 uh, 65 squared is uh, 40, 
Uh, 4225. Okay, I can keep going all the two digit ones. How am I doing that? How am I doing this? They all end in 25. Okay, so that's pretty easy. Uh, and then I, this number here is 1 times 2. This number here is 2 times 3. This number here is 3 times 4. This number here is 4 times 5. This one here is 5 times 6. This one here is 6 times 7. So I'm taking this number here, 2, and then I'm multiplying it by the next number. So I, when I see the 25 squared, I know it ends in 25. I go 2 times 3, I get 6. When I see 35 squared, I know it ends in 25. I, I take 3, I go oh, 3, and I go 3 times 4. Here I take the 4, and I go 4 times 5, and I get 20. Here I take the 5 and go 5 times 6, and I get the 30. 6, 6 times 7. Okay, that will work for all of the two-digit ones. So, and then when I see it's a decimal, I mean, I just have to adjust for the decimal. So I can immediately see, for example, I when I see this, I think, oh, 35 squared, that's 1225. Oh, it's two decimals, uh, that's 12.25. Okay, this is how you can impress your friends when you're out on <laughs> Saturday night. Okay, so I now know that uh, the integral uh, from 1 to uh, 5 from 1 to 5 of dx over x squared is approximately 0 0.7. This, there's more decimals here too, 735. Okay, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we could figure out the exa exact value and then see how much we're out by. But this is one, uh, this is a 4, uh, a 4, an n equals 4 uh, midpoint uh, approximation. Uh, do not dismiss these uh, approximation techniques. In fact, in the, in the in the world of the computer, these are in fact somewhat more important. You can imagine when you ask uh, your computer to um, evaluate a definite integral, um, it it merely has to take enough rectangles so that the error falls below the 10 decimal digits that it's showing you on the screen. It does not have to do any symbolic computation at all. It can just sort of go with the brute force. I guess in some ways the computers are the opposite of Terence Tao. They're just, they're, they're never cunning. They're just brute force. But uh, that because they're fast, way faster than us, um, the, that method works well for them. So uh, knowing how to do things, uh, what we would call numerically, is, is uh, a very important uh, in, the, in our age of, of using computers a lot. Okay, so here's uh, um, some special properties of the integral. Um, that is, if we reverse the limits, this actually doesn't even this doesn't even need to be the true. Uh, if we reverse the limits of integration, then then the negative sign appears here. Um, if the limits of integration are the same, then the integral is zero. So, example, the integral from one to one to one of f of x dx equals zero. I mean, imagine this, you're trying, you're basically saying there is no area underneath a line. Okay. Here's some additional uh, properties of the integral. Uh, just like, and in fact, for the reason that we could factor this out in the sum like this, we can also factor it out uh, in, uh, in, the, in the integral. And uh, that would just leave us with the uh, integral of one. So, um, what this looks like is this c, uh, our function is like that, that is c, and then we have here uh, a and b, and we are merely uh, unsurprisingly claiming that the area here is b minus a times c, okay? And that is c times 1 times b minus a. Okay, similarly, following exactly from the rule that we had for the sums, we can separate the definite integral of the sum of two functions into the sum of two uh, uh, separate different uh, definite integrals. Okay, and then that saying here too, this is that same thing, we can factor out a constant. I mean, uh, scroll back to the uh, to the uh, notes, and, through your notes, and look at the, sum, the rules that we had for sums, and notice that they're basically directly applying to uh, these uh, rules for the uh, definite integral. Okay, uh, let's take a little bit of a closer look here at D, and um, let's just look at a special case of this. It's 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 true in general. Okay, so I'm 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 not 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 trying to. It's true in general. Okay, that's fine. But uh, uh, in in a special case, we can just geometrically see why this has to be true. So let's consider. It doesn't have to be this way. It's true in general. But consider uh, when. Uh, a is less than C is less than B. So C is between A and B. 
okay? And uh, let us also just say, imagine if f of x is greater than or equal to zero. That's just so my picture will, will, will look nice. So that is going to look like this. There we have f of x, and we have here a, and here we have b, and we have here c, somewhere, somewhere in between a and b. All we're saying is that the total area here is the sum of these two areas here, this one plus this one. That is that is what this is. This is it, 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 under these these conditions I put here. That is what this is telling me. I think that's uh, completely unsurprising. Of when you see it as a picture like that, it is, however, uh, true in general. Okay. Let me see if I can get my pen color back. Okay. So uh, what what's coming next? Uh, we're going to evaluate a uh, another uh, definite integral here. I'm going to um, I am going to uh, set this up, and I'm not going to go through all of the steps in quite as much detail. I highly recommend that you actually stop right now and you do this uh, definite integral yourself, and then uh, via the, uh, the the two things that we know, which is finding er recognizing an area of a circle and using uh, limits. Okay, that those two tactics that we've learned so far in the course. And uh, then turn the video back on and check uh, what I did versus what you did. Uh, see if that if you're correct. And if you can't do it for some reason, spend some time trying. That is not wasted time. And then, uh, and then watch the video. And then when it comes to the step that you didn't do, your mind will say, oh, I see. That's what I, that's what I didn't realize when I was doing it on my own. And that's actually a real opportunity to learn something uh, as opposed to just... Uh, sort of watching me a little bit more passively. Okay, so let's let's try to set this thing up. The first thing I'm going to do is break it into two. So I'm going to take this inter integral and I say, okay, so I, I see this minus sign here. So I can, I'm going to break it into two. And I'm going to go from zero to three of two x dx. And then I'm going to take away the integral. And I'm fact going to even factor out the three in the same time. So I'm going to take that like that. So this is using those properties of the integral uh, that we saw on the previous uh, slide, and then I'm going to look at this, and I'm going to identify it as the area of a quarter of a circle with radius three. So that this problem becomes very easy. This this right here is area of one quarter of a circle of radius. Three. Okay, so that, that one is, is, is effectively solved. Then I am going to have to take a look a little bit more carefully at this one. Three. Uh, uh, two times, I'm going to move, factor that two out, and then I'm going to have x dx. Now, one thing I could do is just see that as the area of a triangle. Okay, I would say here's my function. Um, uh, y equals x. That is like this, and it's going from 0 to 3. So there it is, uh, zero to three, and so then I would just say, okay, that's 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 nice. So that means that this is three here, and it's one half the base times the height, uh, that area. So this is going to be two times one half the base times the height. And that's that's so now I'm, I'm going to get that to be uh, uh, nine. That's going to be nine. Okay, that that then this one here. Okay, so now actually, so let me just let me call this something. Let me call this equal to, uh, I don't know, let me just call it equal to s. So I can now say that s, so I don't have to rewrite it. That's going to be, in fact, I just figured out the first one. That's going to be 9. And then I'm going to subtract 3 times, um, let's see, what is the area? Uh, quarter, uh, let's see, 3 times, and that's a 1 quarter, the area of a circle of radius 3. Okay, there it is. So that's... Uh, and then I can uh, I can write that as this this way nine minus let's see that'd be 27 27 pi over four and then that that would be an exact answer and then I could I could put a decimal approximation here if I wanted to minus 12.205 okay uh, the other way of doing this so that that is, to, is seeing both of these um, just geometrically and using that and 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 going pretty quickly based on that. The other thing I you may have done uh, is is taken this integral 
x dx not not noticed that you could just use the area of a triangle and then that's fine if you didn't notice that then then you would do the slightly more laborious uh, procedure of the function evaluated on the ith interval times the width of the interval and you would uh, use the method that we used for evaluating the sums and take the limit and then this thing would come out to 9 over 2 and then you would proceed okay so there's there's a variety of things you can do but what we're, we're what what is uh, important to notice we have not tied this to any conception of the derivative yet not tied to the derivative yet we've been using geometric areas and we've been using the limit of sums Okay, there is uh, a couple of more uh, examples here. I am going to not do all of the details in this example. Again, highly encourage you to try these on your own and then use the steps that I'm writing down to check yourself and, uh, and see what's going on. So what's the difference here between all of our other examples? The only new thing here is that we have a piecewise function. Okay, so the function is defined piecewise. It's equal to one minus X between zero and one, and it's equal to this this complicated thing here between one and three. No worries for us. We use that last property of the definite integral. We had a few slides back and we want to, we want to know what's the integral from zero to three of f of x dx. Well, we just simply say, okay, how is it defined from zero to one? Let me compute that. And how is it defined from one to three? I'll do that one separately. Okay, doesn't matter that there is a change in the definition of the function uh, uh, part way okay and then we we or because we only have two things that we can do in the in the world yet ooh, this one is is some portion of the area of a circle in fact this is a circle uh, centered at two zero uh, with radius equals to one okay so you do that and uh, and uh, uh, the going from one to three, and we, we notice the the minus sign. It, it is it is basically this area here. It's uh, two zero radius one. It looks like that, and we are looking at this area here. Okay, with this point here is two on the x-axis. Okay, uh, so we have a method of that. We know how to calculate these ones either by looking at it as areas of rectangles and triangles or by using the limit of the sums. So either way, uh, uh, or in fact, it, the best possible scenario is you do it both ways, okay? And then you will find that you end up with, uh, let me think here, I just wanna, I, I don't wanna write it down in order that's conf and confusing, this one, uh, this here is going to be minus one half pi. That is the circle. So I'm going to write that here, minus one half pi. That is this one right here. Okay, so that comes out to that. This one uh, here uh, um, comes out to be uh, one minus one half. Uh, and so then the total, when you combine those three things, uh, comes out to be uh, one half minus pi by two and that is approximately minus 1.07. So a few steps missing here, um, but, but going from here, uh, going from here to here, we can, you can either do this geometrically or limit of sums. And then the second, the second one here, we're using uh, area of a circle. Okay, that's all of our techniques. Uh, in one question. So should you be able to uh, cover this one and and do this? That That is good news because it means you understood uh, all of what is happening so far. An excellent example to practice on. Okay, uh, some other properties of the uh, definite integral. Uh, that is if the function is greater than zero, that's a big if, then the integral is greater than zero. Okay, that's a picture of it there. The function is bigger than zero and the integral there bigger than zero. Uh, if one function is bigger than the other on the uh, for the whole uh, on the whole interval, then the integral of that function is bigger than the other function. So here's here's f right here. You can see f is bigger than g all at all times and then the area under f is more than the area under g. Okay, this one um, 
uh, is uh, highly useful uh, sometimes, uh, and that is if we have some constants and we have uh, uh, one constant being less than the function at all times and another constant being bigger than the function at all times, then we can bound the integral. Okay, so let us, let me just draw on here. So I could, for example, notice that this value right here, which I'm going to call little m, is that's lower than f of x at all times. I mean, f of x is the blue line. It's this, this right here. It's not the shaded. It's this thing right here. That's f of x. Okay, so we can see that that line, little m, that value m, little m is smaller than the function. And then I could pick another value, uh, capital M. I just you could pick it up here like that. There it is. Um, let me just kind of extend these lines here like that. Capital M. Capital M is always bigger than f of x. So what I'm saying is uh, this statement here is a statement that the area in the rectangle, let me get this color, this, this area right here, that is this, okay? That area is less than what's under f of x. And then this area, uh, the capital M, is more. Let me just get that one shaded in black. Uh, so then this area here is right here. This is M, that, that value there, times B minus A, that gets you this rectangle here. And that is more. So whatever that blue area is, which may I may have difficulty calculating for some reason, I can at least say it's bigger than the red amount and it's less than the black amount. So that, that can be highly useful. So for there's going to use that right here. Can we prove that the integral from 1 to 2 of e to the minus x squared dx is less than 1 over e and greater than 1 over e to the 4? That's what we want to be able to do. We're going to use the... Uh, uh, this fact C to do that. Uh, let me let me point out for those of you who already know how to integrate, you will not be able to find an expression for the integral of this. Okay, this is does not integrate in terms of elementary functions. So you are will come to this a lot um, more frequently as the course continues. So you will not be able to come up. Uh, uh, with an exact answer under the methods that we that we normally know. And so what we're going to do is say, okay, we don't know exactly what it is, so let's try to at least get a lower bound and an upper bound. This is much like saying, oh, uh, you know, uh, Brenda has some amount of money in the bank. Um, that amount is more than $50 and less than $5,000. So you don't know exactly what I have, but actually I can tell you that's a true statement. I have more than 50 and I do have less than $5,000 in my bank account. So this is just a way of giving us some sort of indication of where uh, uh, the, the amount of money that I have sits, okay? And so we're gonna try to do that exact thing. So here's a plot of the function e to the minus x squared. This is an important function, actually. We're, it's gonna come up uh, several times. And uh, we're, we're looking at the area here uh, between, uh, what was the integral? We wanted to look at the area from one to two. Okay, so we got we're, what we're what we're looking at is uh, we were looking at we're looking at this area here. That's what we got told to compute because we wanted to know uh, well, what is from one to two of e to the minus x squared dx. And we 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 can't compute that. So now what we're doing is we are attempting to bound it. So what I'm what I'm how I'm going to bound this is to say okay, I need to find some number that is less than the function. And I see that the function is minimum right here. So I'm going to say here's going to be my little m right there. Because uh, when I compute this area, it'll clearly be less than the uh, black area, which is what I want to know. And then I'll also notice that uh, the function is maximum here. And so if I was going to I'll extend that out like that, if I calculate this green area in here like that, I can see that that is an upper bound on the area I'm trying to compute. So then I simply um, look at this value here too. So then that allows me to calculate this value here and that's gonna be e to the minus four. And then I look at this value here, well here it's one, and then I'm calculating what this is here. So little m here is one over e. Uh, yeah, because when e to the minus one squared is 1 over e, and then I'm going to call this value here capital M. 
Okay, so I have that uh, 1 over e to the 4 is less than or equal to e to the minus x squared, less than or equal to 1 over e for uh, x between 1 and 2. Uh, so I've got an upper and lower bound on my function between uh, between 1 and 2. And then I'm, I'm between 1 and 2, so a is equal to 1, b is equal to 2, so b minus b minus a uh, b minus a is uh, 1 so then I can uh, assert with confidence here that uh, 1 times 1 over e to the 4 that's uh, b minus a times little m is less than or equal to this integral and that indeed is, is also then less than or equal to 1 times 1 over e and that's in fact what I wanted to show. So it's it's good. Okay, so I'm 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 looking at the uh, being able to bound integrals that I can't compute. Okay, we have one final thing to do here, uh, and that is to look at uh, uh, a bit of a proof. Uh, this is, I believe, unless it's uh, this might be question uh, page 385, uh, question 68. If it's not exactly question 68, it'll be sometimes the question numbers change when the Stuart calculus textbook editions change. But it is it, this is a question from the textbook. Okay, so let's let's think about what we're being told here. If the function is continuous on a b, show that the absolute value of the definite integral is less than or equal to the definite integral of the absolute value of the function. Okay, first, I mean before you start any kind of uh, um, thing to try to show this, ask yourself: Does this make sense? Does this seem right? Why does it seem right? Okay, so first spend a bit of time uh, doing that, and then we want part B. We want to show that if f is continuous, then the absolute value of this integral uh, is less than the um, this uh, integral. And notice this is not the same, right? Like this here is not here, so this is gone. So this is not exactly the same as the uh, condition above. Okay, so let's uh, let's do a proof of of a. Okay, uh, for any x, uh, it is the case that the absolute value, the, the negative of the absolute value of f of x is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to the absolute value of f of x. Okay, regardless of it, whether f is positive or negative, so uh, it'll always be bigger than the negative of its absolute value, and it'll always be less than its absolute value. Okay, that's uh, that's that's a statement. Um, uh, then we're going to recall that um, if f of x greater than or equal to g of x, then the integral from a to b of f of x is greater than or equal to the integral from a to b of g of x. That was one of our properties of integrals. Okay, so we're going to put those things together. We have a, a condition here on the function. Now what we're going to do is just go through and uh, integrate on both sides. Therefore, the integral from a to b of minus the absolute value of f of x dx is less than or equal to the integral from a to b of f of x dx, and that's less than or equal to the integral from a to b of the absolute value of f of x dx. Okay, uh, however, uh, recall this, uh, and so this is a bit of an aside to convince you of my next step. Um, notice if I have this, if I have, if I make this statement, the absolute value of x less than or equal to y, okay, that is uh, x will be a real number and y will be a positive real number okay if i have that then that immediately implies that minus y is less than or equal to x less than or equal to y and that is in fact exactly uh, what i have uh, above if i equate uh, x whoops sorry about that if i equate x to this I'm thinking that, and then I see that these two things, in fact, are, in fact, I would, well, yeah, I, I see I have y here and 
minus y here. Okay, where y, so I, I, I'm using this fact that I know about absolute value and numbers to observe uh, what I can say about this, and that allows me to then write down, therefore, um, the absolute value a to b of f of x dx is less than or equal to the absolute value of f of x dx. Okay, so that is part A done. Okay, one final thing in this lecture, we've gone a little bit over time. I'm going to try to keep these things to under an hour. Um, apologize for that. I, I, I have extra sort of in some sense I have extra time so I get all excited and I keep wanting to add more and more detail. I don't want to make these things too onerously long though. Okay, the final thing we're going to do is we're going to attempt to show that uh, the integral from 0 to 2 pi of f of x uh, sine 2x dx is less than or equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi the absolute value of f of x dx. Oh, I think uh, one thing actually I should just say, <laughs> make it longer, is is uh, um, we are in an unusual situation at least at the time when I'm recording these lectures and that some portion of this class is going to be um, online with uh, you remote with these remote lectures uh, and so we're not uh, we may be in the situation where we don't have in-person exams and that actually is causing us to ask questions that are less computational during exams so you should be aware and and try to train yourself to uh, look at the problems that are less uh, computational, less easily done by something like Wolfram Alpha, and realize that those are more likely to be uh, exam questions than they than they were in the past before before the world got turned upside down. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, this integral here this, uh, on the right hand side. So that is the absolute value absolute value signs. Despite the fact that they are subtle, they are tricky, and in fact they are sometimes annoying. They will not go away. So you must uh, uh, you must learn to uh, embrace them. <laughs> okay, so that is uh, less than or equal to this integral here. Uh, how come? Well, that's what we just showed on in part A. Okay, by part A, which we proved. Okay, and then that is less than or equal to this thing here. Okay, because uh, what, why? Uh, this is a, a true statement. Okay, so that's a property of the absolute value sign. So then that is going to be less than or equal to uh, uh, this thing here. Uh, because uh, sine 2x less than or equal to 1. Okay, so then we're done. Okay, so we showed what we wanted to. All right, uh, thank you for that. And uh, uh, next lecture will be uh, section uh, 5.3.